Game of Thrones Season 5, Episode 4, Sons of the Harpy. I didn't like that, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones Season 5, Episode 4, Sons of the Harpy. I'm like, I didn't like that, Game of Thrones. Did the same exact one. <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the intro. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to start again. No. We've been uh, all for a game with these intros lately. I'm not keeping all these, so <laughs> this is it. We're just getting right into it. Right. No more jokes. We're going in. I don't know why this makes me laugh, but on my notes for the first scene, I have Jorah steals a boat. <laughs> Yo, read That's, it. It says, yeah, Jorah steals a <laughs> yeah, boat. Yeah, the same thing. It feels like the uh, like an episode title for a sitcom. <laughs> what wacky adventure is Jorah going to get into? <laughs> it would be funny if that rumor got back to Daenerys when Jorah got back there. It's like, I was going to pardon you, but then I heard you punch that guy and stole his boat, so. Well, he left him, like, some coins, so at least he paid for it. I think they were just chocolate coins. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, this will fool them. <laughs> it would be funny if some guy just came and robbed him. <laughs> yeah, they, they set sail, him and Tyrion. Tyrion's trying to cut himself free with the knife. I don't know how he got that knife. That's e- not a knife. eBay? That's a knife. Can you get a knife in it? Yeah, I know you can get one at Dick's Sporting Goods. Yeah. You can get a lot of weird things at Dick's. I have a gift card, actually. I should go there. No dildos, though. Yeah, this next scene, we have Jamie and Braun also setting sail. We've got two pairs, two duos here. This is an interesting conversation that they have. They talk about Tyrion, they talk about Marcella, and why it has to be Jaime that sails to Dorne to get her. And you can see that it's coming from a very personal place from Jaime, where you can dislike the decision to send him to Dorne, but at least you're, you're getting more into the inside of how Jaime is thinking this yeah. situation through. And we see a nice little shot of uh, Tarth on the way there. The Brianna Sapphire Tarth. Islands. Yes. Yeah, it's actually got the name, Brianna Tarth. Is, is Tarth her last name? Yeah, Lord Selwyn Tarth, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. Right. That's weird, right? I knew that. It's yeah, not it like is weird. A John <laughs> Rob of Winterfell. Yeah, bow of soup. <laughs> I like that. I can dig that. Bo- <laughs> it's a little, bow nice little soup. play on words, like bowl of soup. Oh, yeah. wow. I wasn't even thinking that through. That's why my brain is on the next level. Catch up. I like catch up. Yeah, but it's Patrick Mahomes, little known fact. Um, yeah, I like catch up. <laughs> yeah, but they go over their plan of what they're going to do once they get to Dorne. And uh, yeah, Bron wants to know. Why you? Why don't we send 40 people? Why don't, you know, Jamie's like, oh, well, we don't want to start a war, but why does it have to be you? You can send me and somebody else. You're obviously incapable if you're only having your left hand. He deduces that um, it was him that freed Tyrion. Yeah. So now I guess he feels guilty or he's trying to get back into good graces of Cersei. So he feels that he has to go save his daughter. Yeah, that's definitely it. And it's similar to Jamie in the books where he's not trying to start a war with the Dornish. He's also... Very upset with Tyrion. Yes. We get into the mindset of him wanting to kill Tyrion if they were ever to meet again because Bronn says, send him my regards. And Jamie says, yeah, I'll slit his throat and then I'll send him your regards. I said I'll split him in two. Split him in two. That would make him the quarter man. That doesn't have the same ring to it as Tyrion once stated. But it is a nice scene between Jamie and Bronn, and I, I really do love their chemistry. Good chemistry here, too, between Mace Tyrell and Cersei. Cersei's leading the small council meeting, and she's talking about the Iron Bank and... They always get their due. Um, <laughs> Macy's, he's, his he jokes needs to here work so on his act a little. I want to start with that one. Right. He is I, kind of adorable. Though. I think I would make the same joke, too. <laughs> or else I'll have a word with my daughter. <laughs> Pycelle gives him um, a pity laugh at the end. He's like, I'll give the um, Titan of Bravos your regards. I'll give you that one, Mace. That was Kyburn. Oh, no, yeah, Kyburn <laughs> gives him the pity laugh, right. Kyburn's a good sport. Yeah. He does some weird stuff, but I like him. I'd invite him to, like, a housewarming. Really? Yeah, Kyburn, yeah. I like Kyburn. You'd be, be like Kyburn guy. the person you invite to you, like your house party, and, you know, there's a main area where everyone's partying, but he's, like, off looking in rooms and stuff. In your medicine cabinet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's Kyburn. <laughs> looking at your stuffed dog. Like, oh, clone him. And Cersei sends Mace Tyrell to Bravos with Marin Trant to <laughs> yeah. uh, talk to the Iron Bank. Marin Trant is, I mean, Mace Tyrell is flattered. My own king's god. <laughs> that's awesome. It's like, Mace, old boy, you finally made it. Yeah, and Cersei's sending Marin Trant to his death. Poor Marin, but he's a terrible person, so good. <laughs> yeah, fuck Marin Trant. Fuck Marin Trant. So smug, too. Whenever he walks into a room, he just looks evil. Why would anybody You're not that, that nice. <laughs> Great line, too, by Pycelle. The small council grows smaller and smaller. The small council grows smaller and smaller. Not small enough. And then she goes to meet with the High Sparrow. And at this point in time, you're still thinking the High Sparrow might be a good guy. 
obviously if he's getting into cahoots with Cersei, it's going to backfire because she is an idiot. And the way that she's playing up religion in this scene, she's very charismatic and she can fool you into believing that she is a pious individual. Mm -hmm. But High Sparrow's playing his own game here. And that's why it's so dangerous that Cersei makes this, that she forms this partnership with him. Yeah, she brings up the resurgence of the faith militant arming the faith pretty much and um she puts him in charge of the faith of westeros and yeah it's kind of funny too when she describes uh loris or you can make it could be loris or marjorie interchangeable and it she, sounds just like she herself. describes herself <laughs> and he's like yeah you, you're right <laughs> all sinners are equal under the gods dangerous sentiment i'll keep that in mind sir. faith militant is interesting part of westerosi history because when you read the new fire and blood book you see the conflict that the targaryens had with the faith of the seven Mm -hmm. because of things that they did the incest the marrying brother to sister and there was conflict there but they did compromise and they learned to work together now cersei arming these people who haven't been around for hundreds of years they're just running rampant throughout the city the way that they run into littlefinger's brothel it's a bad look too i mean if you do take up arms against them you're taking arms against the faith pretty much right that's what the city watched when they both turn their backs well in the eyes of the small folk that's like you know it's not the best look but yeah you get this like montage of them just being fucking dicks (laughs) going in they're killing people they're fucking running into littlefinger's brothel they're scalp uh carving the symbol into uh into lancel's head all of ours having a tough time in the brothel doesn't look like the best group to be in <laughs> how many times has littlefinger's brothel been ran up on <laughs> in season two season it's always uh, something's always going down in that brothel babies being killed you know loris is arrested too and I, at f- the first time i saw this i thought he was going to try and fight back because i would like to have seen prime loris fight but it's one of those things that's kind of left to the imagination and then marjorie star- storms in on tommen and says my brother's been arrested and tommen is just a deer in headlights all oh, yeah. of this hits him out of nowhere just so oblivious he's like oh i thought you and my mother were getting along she's like oh god and it's funny cersei complained about tywin and marjorie pushing him into different directions and that's exactly what cersei does she breaks this kid yeah and and this is just the beginning it's the first pull well you can see in marjorie's face like she kind of changes her tone a little because then she realizes all right he has no idea what's going on yeah and it just shows us how easily later in the season just how easily he gets manipulated by everybody, Cersei, Marjorie, the High Sparrow. And that, that's the first person he goes to, to Cersei. He says, I demand that Sir Loras be freed. And Cersei says, I didn't arrest him. Tommen, I mean, he's just a kid at this point. What do you even do when he goes to talk to the High Sparrow and he doesn't want to kill any of the Faith Militant? A lot of people said that they wanted Joffrey in this moment because he would have taken all of them out. I wrote my notes. I missed Joffrey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of people made that joke. But when you're there at the Sept of Baelor and the small folk are screaming, bastard, abomination, and then you just kill all these religious people, like you said, in the eyes of the small folk, they could be looked upon as the the keepers of the peace in Westeros now because they're not working for the king, for the royalty. They're working for the people, Mm -hmm. or so they say. So it's not a great look if you were to just massacre all these young men. Fuck them. Yeah, that's probably the approach I would have taken. Yeah. It's so funny in the show that characters never get the opportunity to use their powers in moments where they're needed you know it's it's oh, yeah. like joffrey is the perfect religious extremist <laughs> time king yeah you know tom is a good pe- peacetime king it's just a mess that Cersei created <laughs> and he goes back to marjorie and marjorie's obviously disappointed well, now she's fucking pissed yeah she's pissed now she's like well you're the f- you're the king like <laughs> it's like she wanted him to be more joffrey like in that moment but it's, yeah it's tommen and the, the first thing that she does she decides to write to olena because that's the person that you want to get into the fold when this stuff is going down. Mm-hmm. You need to get the, the Queen of Thorns back in King's Landing. I have to send word to Grandmother. Will you come back later? I need to be with my family, Your Grace. Of course. There's an interesting line, too, in this next scene when we go to Castle Black that Stannis says about Jon Snow. When Selyse tries to claim, why are you putting so much faith in him? He's just some bastard boy born of some whore, some some random woman. And Stannis thinks to himself, yeah, but that wasn't Ned Stark's way. So even there, there's some doubt in his mind. Think he his knows? Parentage. <laughs> I, th- I think it's, it, w- it was kind of hard for Ned to keep up that secret because he has this reputation. But then it's like, oh, I also have a bastard. Yeah. And it doesn't really make sense. And then we also get the story in this episode. It's not a coincidence with Rhaegar and Lyanna. You think there's some 
not a Twitter conspiracy, but a Westerosi conspiracy theorist out there connecting the dots to John being a Targaryen. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. The time. Everyone's like, ah, oh, you crazy, pal. Well, that guy now stands outside the ruins of the Sept of Baylor and says, it was Queen Cersei who was an inside job. She made money off of this <laughs> with the Golden Company. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely people. Well, people thought Littlefinger knew that he was at, uh, <laughs> I think it was the end of the crossroads where they had met up, Lyanna and Rhaegar, that mm-hmm. Littlefinger spotted them. That theory is insane, uh, that Littlefinger had this knowledge the whole time. Because even when he talks about it with Sansa, it's, how much do you know? There's no way he can know this. It's like Littlefinger knows everything. You can't fucking time travel. I love an insane theory, though. Those are always the best ones. That kind of make sense, but are so outlandish that they can't be true. And you're just like, maybe. But while talking about John, Selyse changes the subject, and she's upset that she never gave Stannis a son, and she kind of disses uh, Shireen a little, which, um, yeah. They call back to that later in the episode. I think we may make this joke a lot, Selyse. Keep, uh, keep talking shit. Keep that same energy, girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, seeing Jon Snow, she sees what Stannis could have had, um, a true heir mm-hmm. in the eyes of Westeros. But Melisandre comes down, and the look that she gives to Selyse just grills her, and Selyse knows, eh, it's time for me to go away. Yeah. Um... And Melisandre and Stannis, they're discussing the march on Winterfell. And Melisandre is saying, don't make the same mistake you did at Blackwater. Take me with you. Because I'm going to make sure half of your army leaves. <laughs> and that you have no chance to I win. I will burn your daughter. <laughs> Take me, keep me with you, Stannis. Um, and she's overlooking Jon Snow as well. And I always make fun of her in the book because she looks in the visions and she's like, I asked for Azor High, and the Lord of Light only shows me snow. Oh, hey, Jon Snow. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy come on Mel you're better than that but before that Mil- before Melisandre meets John, he's doing some Lord Commander stuff they're kind of signing different decrees to bring in more men from some of the houses in the north and it goes to show how north how big the north is John doesn't even know half of these people yeah but he knows one name and that's uh, Ruse Bolton and he's hesitant to sign it at first but Sam's like hey man we have 50 people here and he's the warden of the north yeah once again Jon Snow putting the collective before himself he hesitates at first. Yeah, that's the man that killed my brother, killed my best friend, but we need the men. And Melisandre just barges in. Does it, You don't knock? And she reiterates most of what Stannis was saying, that she wants Jon to come with them to Winterfell. He knows the ins and outs, the secret tunnels, and all that good stuff. Yeah, there's something about her argument that was just more convincing for me. I don't know. I can't put my finger on it. Yeah, I think she made a very compelling case. Yeah, I think yeah, very... I would have been like, you know what? I... Sw- I swore this holy vow, but you make a valid point. Yeah, you and, make really good, you know, big fa- points. Family and honor, uh, all that life, stuff. Life, light. But she, uh, I think she sensed right away John's going to be a tough cookie to crack, so she whipped out the uh, her go-to right away. Oh, yeah, she just got <laughs> naked. <laughs> she didn't know. She's like, you know, sex is great, but you ever have sex? <laughs> That's all I got here. <laughs> and become Lord of Winterfell? And beca- yeah, right. I was thinking about this, too. I mean... If John did succumb to her uh, persuasions, she probably would have had like a monster shadow baby. Because you think about it, John has some serious fucking king's blood. Yeah, I guess that's what determines how good your shadow baby is. Yeah. Yeah, no, seriously, that shadow baby would have been brolic. It would have been like Dwayne the Rock Johnson stand in <laughs> shadow baby. I mean, Baratheon CGI. king's blood, that's, you know, it's she not probably bad. would have shadow baby twins. <laughs> yeah, that's good king's blood. You get some Targaryen king's blood in there. He's got best of both worlds, man. What a fucking. Ended the fucking war right there. It speaks to Jon Snow, though, man. We we keep saying it. We see so many examples of it over the last couple of episodes. The way that he's able to put duty before honor in so many instances. And this one is probably his hardest test. <laughs> Left him, you know, pretty stiff, but he was able to wiggle out of there. You done? It's tough, man. I, I would have, yeah, like you said, I would have succumbed to the sorcery. <laughs> I'll do whatever you say. Put some kind of spell on me. I don't know what it was. But uh, yeah, he denies her and she walks away, but hits him with that you know nothing upon leaving. You know nothing, Jon Snow. Yeah, and he mentions that he still loves Egret. Mm-hmm. That's his excuse here, which is even more interesting. It's, yeah, I, I swore a vow, not to the Night's Watch, to Egret, and I'm not ready to let that go. He didn't say that to Daenerys. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did not have that conversation. Yeah, it's been a couple of years. He died, you right, know? Yeah. I think I think you're allowed to reset once you die. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, until death. <laughs> That's what they, that was their vow. Until death, they both died. He came back. I got a new lease. <laughs> it's like the Larry David. It's like eternity. I thought it just stops at death. I thought this was over at death. I didn't know we we went into eternity together. I, isn't that what it said? And till death do us part. I thought it was. Do you have a problem with eternity? Well, 
Yeah, but she does hit him with that one line. And it goes to show that Melisandre does have her magic. Even though in this scene she says no magic, no illusions, but at the end she saw something in Jon. She probably saw that relationship that they had, um, the passion between them, and she brings out that one line and the smirk on her face. Carice Van Houten doesn't get enough credit from us, I think. We never really compliment her performance, but she's great as this character. Yeah. Um, and another great scene between Stannis and Shireen, it always makes me choke up when parents confirm their love for their children when the child really didn't know. And Stannis is such a cold individual, he doesn't show much emotion, but what he says to Shireen in this scene, it's just so heartwarming. Yeah, he reflects on when she was born and when she got the grayscale and all the stuff that he did to help her, where people were saying, send her off to live with the stone men. And, but he said no, he brought in all the best maesters and stuff like that from all over the place to try to save her. And before that, when Serene says, mother didn't want me to come, why would you say that? She told me she didn't want me to come. Same, like you said, Selyse needs to keep that same energy <laughs> when they light that girl up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the things that he says to her, you know, that they all told me to send you away and I told them to go to hell. That you were my daughter, that you're the Princess Shireen of the House Baratheon. And Shireen starts to cry, even though she's very mature for her age. In that moment, she loves her daddy. Yeah. It's good to see that relationship. I hope he doesn't burn the bridge. Then you are my daughter. And this is the scene that we talked about before um, with Sansa and the crypts of Winterfell. We also see the feather that Robert Baratheon placed on Lyanna's tomb, something that was in the teaser yes. for season eight, something that was in the previously on Game of Thrones before watching this episode. Did you have to bury her in a place like this? She should be on a hill somewhere with the sun and the clouds above her. She was my sister. This is where she belongs. She belonged with me. And Littlefinger stumbles upon her. It's the first time that he sneaks up on a Stark in the crypts of Winterfell. He does it to John in season seven. That one doesn't end as well. But it's very interesting that he talks about the tourney of Harrenhal, um, a very famous event, one of the really instigating events that led to Robert's rebellion. Yeah, and of course, the, s the story goes how Rhaegar unhorsed Sir Barristan and gave, and gave his favor to Lyanna rather than Elia, his wife. The queen of love and beauty or something yeah. like that. Yeah, very. Well, good. I wish they would have kept the scene too. Uh, obviously, they're not in this season between... Bran and Jojen and Mira, where Mira tells the story about the night of the Laughing Tree, mm -hmm. and everybody's pretty convinced that Lyanna joined the tourney as this anonymous knight and was just kicking the shit out of everybody because she was known as a great rider. And then Rhaegar stumbled upon her and discovered that it was actually Lyanna Stark, and that's why he gave her the crown or the favor. So Howland Reed is indirectly responsible for thousands and thousands of lives. Yeah, and yeah. He kind of is, because he was such a, you know, oh, they're bullying me. Don't come at Helen like that. He saved Ned. Yeah, he saved Ned by stabbing Arthur Dane in the back. I'm a Dane guy. Sorry. <laughs> it was not honorable. <laughs> um, but the perception that people still have of Rhaegar in the Seven Kingdoms, and it's, a, it's great because we get the story about Rhaegar from Barristan's perspective, which is probably the truth. I think we know that it's the truth, but Sansa believes that Rhaegar kidnapped her aunt and raped her. Yeah, And Littlefinger, the way he smiles, is like, I don't know about that. That's probably done by the showrunners, too. It's like a wink and a nod yeah. at the book readers, conspiracy theorists. And uh, Littlefinger tells her that he's going to King's Landing, and this obviously worries Sansa, because he's leaving her alone with these monsters. The plan kind of makes sense. No, it doesn't. Here. Not really. You fooled me for a little bit. Not really, because when you think about it, if Stannis Littlefinger, has got a big-ass army. If Littlefinger does bet on Stannis and he does think he's going to take Winterfell, then why go to Winterfell before Stannis takes it? Well, he didn't know that. Once he takes Winterfell, you show up with Sansa, here's the fucking heir to the north, hook me up now, we'll get the north on our side, and I'm in a much better position. Well, he's playing like four different hands here. I'm just saying. He's playing so many goddamn different hands. That's what makes it sloppy. I think overall that's what makes it so disappointing is that he's got like five different endgames here. And with Littlefinger, yeah, he'll make sure that he has contingencies. But these aren't even contingencies. These are just hopefully one of these happens. That's why it's stupid. Yeah. 
But here it kind of made sense to me. It made sense to Sansa, too. Sansa's like, ooh, Wardeness of the North. I like the sound of that. I always wonder how that works. Then she marries somebody, and then do they, like, take her name? It's very progressive. Nice Umber. Nice, yeah, that, yeah, that's true. Umber Stark. <laughs> yeah. That's very powerful. <laughs> Great line, though, even though it's a stupid plan when she says, when Littlefinger tells Sansa, you just have to figure out how to maneuver, and you've learned from the best. <laughs> It's the first time he kind of gets a little cocky, you know? Regarding Ramsey. It's like, oh, he's quite smitten with you. (laughs) So stupid. (laughs) It's like, I'm afraid of her father. So yeah, he does seem a little weird, right? Did kill your brother after all. Right. I'm sure Ramsey will protect you. And leading up to when Jamie and Braun finally arrive in Dorne, great moment where Braun is rowing and he looks at Jamie and Jamie just raises his hand and says, sorry, can't do it. I'll get us a good parking spot, though. I got my uh, handicap permit, so. We get right into the coast. Yes. It's like, oh, okay, I'll take that. I wonder how snake tastes. Breakfast. I'm somebody who's willing to eat anything. Yeah. So when I saw them eat that snake, I was like, yeah, I'd, I'd eat a snake. What about honey locust? Yeah. Yeah. When when I go to China one day, I'm going to that strip that they have with all the insects. Oh, that's actually cannibalism for me. <laughs> Damn. Damn. Oh, my goodness. Wow. It's like feeding your chicken chicken. I don't know. I'd eat a snake. I feel like it's scaly. You might skin it. Yeah, you got to skin the snake. (laughs) Don't they shed anyway, though? Yeah, they skin themselves. Mm. There you go. Got to get out the poison, though. Yeah, maybe it adds flavor. Yeah, it's the spice. I do like the conversation they have before, though, talking about their deaths. Mm. And Bronn says that he wants to die in his keep with his children squabbling over his fortune. (laughs) Jamie's disappointed. He says, hey, my life's been exciting. I want a boring death. It's kind of like the opposite of me. Like, I want to go down in, like, a blaze of glory because my life sucks. <laughs> so I want my death to be awesome. Yeah, you only die once, right? Everyone's so caught up on YOLO, but same can go from dying. So go out with a bang. I'm Yodo. 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 <laughs> and Jamie says he wants to die in the arms of the woman he loves. He might get that wish in season eight. Be careful what you wish for, kid. Well, she'll probably die in your arms. Ah, a little yeah. reverse. A oh, little no. reverse prophecy. Balan Carr action. Yeah, but they do run into some trouble here. And Braun's trying to talk them down, and Jamie fucks it up. Yeah, I thought the the sharks were going to get us. There are no sharks here. Just play it off like a joke. It's like, yeah, I, I know there's no sharks. I was joking, you <laughs> yeah, fuck. Do you know that? Yeah. <laughs> Stupid. And it's one of those scenes where it's, even though he was starting to become my favorite character up until this point, he probably already was, but when he catches that fucking sword with his hand, yeah, I'm like, that's catch. the love of my life. I love that, too, when well, Braun takes out two right away. And then drops the other guy. Instead of going over and stabbing him real quick, he's like, yeah, that one's slow enough That's for you. practice. <laughs> yeah. Why are you taking that chance? Jamie's your fucking meal ticket. Well, it was so that he can catch the sword in his hand, which is an awesome moment. And the Dornish man must have been like, what the fuck? <laughs> the magic golden hand. Nice move. And then we have the introduction to the three sand snakes that we get in season five. Yeah. And having a nice little powwow. Tyene, I know. Uh, and uh, Yo Baba, <laughs> I think is the other Mo one. Mo Bamba. Mo Bamba. <laughs> yeah. And oh, no, um, Abara and Nim. And Iron Fist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Abara and Nim. And then they captured the ship captain that told him about Jamie. He's hedging his bets, huh? He got the bag from Jamie and now he wants another bag. He wants, yeah, we're going for two bags. What is he, Teddy? <laughs> Seriously, he's, he's ordering too much food, man. Just yeah. take your fucking burritos and go. <laughs> That's ridiculous. It is brutal, his death scene, but these characters, they're cartoon characters. It's not even Game of Thrones. Even the dialogue here, if they find uh, Marcella before us, then we won't be able to get our revenge. When Obaro was talking, I'm like, no one fucking cares. Oh, that's the worst story. Like Stannis' monologue flashback Such was boring so boring exposition. Yeah. And it's just not Game of Thrones. I don't know what show these characters are in but yeah they were on my screen they were on my tv so Cause even like illyria in season four she had like a certain way about her she was very charismatic much like much to the like of oberon where you're like oh i like the, i like these people like what are what's their like what are they doing like there's just so much to that character it feels like even though they don't give you too much but i guess when they rip back the curtain and get back into the character that they the character that they set out to portray it just feels a little off yeah, no, it feels very off. She loses all that charisma and charm because she's just so filled with rage. Mm-hmm. And that's something you can't say about a lot of characters in these show. Yeah, they have one goal in mind. Look at Cersei Lannister. She's insane. She's always trying to exact her revenge on people. But she never loses her charm, if you want to call it that. 
Alaria, I'll call it that. Yeah, you'll you'll call it that. You've called it that before. But Alaria, yeah, she becomes very one note, and her little army here. We know it's it's been said before. So let's just move on. Tyrion and Jorah, back on that boat. And Tyrion is so annoying. He's like Donkey and Shrek. Just won't stop popping his mouth. <laughs> It's actually a good comparison. <laughs> he really is. Jorah is a fucking perfect Shrek. Oh, yeah. Well, that that's kind of how they describe him in the book. This felt like book Jorah. He's just sitting there sulking, not <laughs> yeah. saying anything. Well, Jorah, clap back at him. Um, but Tyrion deduces right away that he's Jorah Mormont. He sees the sigil. He can tell that he's a Westerosi knight. And all the information about Jorah spying on Daenerys comes back to him, and he deduces that he betrayed, that Daenerys found out about Jorah's betrayal. And it is a very stupid plan. Yeah, the, and the way Tyrion's able to deduce, like you said, Sherlock-level stuff right there. I wonder how smart Tyrion is. I wouldn't put him Sherlock-level. <laughs> no, I'm joking. It's pretty, no, 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 he's close, It's though. just a bare fucking <laughs> sid- <laughs> <laughs> embodied. His name tag. Yeah, it's right there for him, but... um, He's got the Jorah Mormon Nikes. <laughs> the Jorah Jor- Ones. The Jorah Ones getting <laughs> sponsorship. Those hydro dunks. Uh, I don't think the Mormons get the Nike sponsorship. They get, like, Puma. Puma, yeah, Puma. <laughs> yeah. Little uh, Starks, Lannisters, they're Nike Jordans, you know. They get like the Chinese deal, you know. The China's trying to come into the market. You should have went like Big Baller brand, and I might have picked up on it. Big Baller brand, yeah. Big Jorah brand, I could see that. Who would be the Le- who is the Levar Ball of Westeros? Jano Slint. <laughs> <That's> yeah. what, <laughs> he's always talking a big game, but then he gets his head chopped off. You know, <laughs> it's a relationship that I enjoy. Tyrion and Jorah. I thought in this scene we were going to see old Valyria. Mm. I kind of got them mixed up, but Tyrion tells him, your plan is probably going to go the opposite way. <laughs> yeah, they're a nice odd couple. He gives Tyrion a nice little back end, which is mean. Oh, yeah, he does slap the shit out of him. <laughs> he does. Holy shit. And up until this point, I'm like, this is a really good episode, right? But I forgot the ending. Oh, yeah. But before that ending, might be one of my top five favorite scenes of the season. But hearing this story about Rhaegar Targaryen from Barristan is perfect. Mm-hmm. It's such a great scene between these two characters, two characters that I both love. And their relationship, they were just becoming best friends. <laughs> yeah, it gives Danny some hope, especially after especially after he told her about uh, the Mad King and her father. And this was kind of like, well, you know, he's the, the best. Everyone loved Rhaegar. Perfect way to establish trust, too, because she sees that he wasn't afraid to tell her about her father. But then this story about her brother, she knows that he can believe mm-hmm. him. And, it, yeah, it speaks to the man that Rhaegar Targaryen was. One of the most fascinating characters in all of A Song of Ice and Fire, when you read about him, the enigma that was Rhaegar Targaryen. He's got a lot of Jon Snow in him, and he's got a lot of Tyrion in him. And he was just like this tragic figure that was obsessed with gaining knowledge and prophecy. He became a great fighter, even though he didn't like fighting. And the stories about him wandering around King's Landing, just playing his harp and singing to people. He's a, he's an oddball, that Rhaegar. He'd have been such a good king. He, he he would have been a great king. And even, you know, living his life with the Death Wish. Not the Death Wish, but thinking that he was going to die young. It's it's great when you hear these stories. And like you said, it gives Daenerys some hope that she can be the next Rhaegar Targaryen. Yes. That she can live up to that legacy that he set. And it's a great final goodbye between them two. Dario comes up and says, you've got his door waiting for you. You've got 50 other people. She says, Barrison, we don't need you. Take the day off. Sing a song for me. Go, Sir Barristan. Sing a song for me. Your grace. Don't die in an alleyway. <laughs> oh, I was just going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she goes, his door is lobbying again for the fighting pits. They need a reform campaign finance, man. Daener- <laughs> Daenerys won't budge, but, you know, he's talking about the glory. You know, these people's name will live on. They don't have much. This is the only thing worth, lack of a better phrase, fighting for. That chance at glory, but Daenerys still refuses. It's almost fighting season two, he says. Yeah, and the thing is, if Barrison didn't die at the end of this episode, this not a, it's not a montage, but this back and forth going between his door, his door's pleas, and then the Unsullied finding the Sons of the Harpy, it's all very well shot yeah. and executed. No, it's a pretty cool, actually. And it's a great moment when they're all fighting in that alleyway, and it just ends up with Grey Worm by himself, and Barrison comes in looking like a G, and to see the old legend to move like that with the swift movements, and he's he is carving them up. For a moment. The Unsullied are very overrated. There is a lot of them there. In the show. Yeah. Because, there's, that yeah. There's a lot There's a lot of Unsullied, too. And a couple of them fucking die right away. One on one. Like, straight up. And, come on. Show me something. I paid good money for you. Well, not. I stole you. <laughs> Whatever. I set you free. Yeah, I maneuvered and did all this stuff with my dragon. You, big time. you saw it. Episode four. Uh, season four, episode three. 
go back and watch it. Look at all that. Look at all that stuff I did. Season three, episode four. Yeah, same thing. Not really. No. <laughs> no, no. Get my numbers mixed up. It sold me a bill of goods here. You know, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have done all that. Nah, that's messed up. <laughs> she tries to return them. <laughs> uh, yeah, my own cell aren't working. Well, did you get the warranty? What do you mean the warranty? No, but um, I think a lot. I mean, you know, they're in a confined space. They have the spears, so I guess... Don't uh, make excuses I'm for this tr- I'm trying. disaster. They're I'm legendary tr- in the book. Dothraki fear them. Yeah. They've been known to... Dothraki will go to sack a city, and they know that the city is hired on Sully, and they'll be like, let's go hit the next one. Mm-hmm. We don't want to mess with these guys. And even Barrison, I can understand Barrison is an older man. Mm-hmm. Maybe eight people can eventually kill him. No, I don't... I don't, I don't but think... But why put him in that position? Exactly. That's not the egregious part of it. I mean, him one versus eight, I don't care how good you are, you know, you can slip up and, you know, something bad can happen. And it's not out of the realm of possibility that he died one versus eight. But for this to even take place is kind of ridiculous. And I think it could have been a great scene with him saving Grey Worm, you know, even if he doesn't die. But, you know, he takes a couple licks, but he ends up persevering and him and Grey Worm work out. Still a great scene, a great moment. Yeah. But it, it really him alive. It's the transition, though, from, like you said, Barrison to Tyrion. I guess, yeah, they I just guess, made Tyrion Barrison. I guess they didn't want to keep both of them around, which... You could have had both of them. Yeah. Uh, it's, once again, the butterfly effect of not having young Griff. So right now in the book, I mean, Barristan is... What is he? He's still presiding in Marine because Daenerys has left the whole thing with the dragon. She takes oh, off. Oh, yeah, he's... And he's presiding over... the fucking s- the yeah. country. <laughs> and he's, you know, he's probably not long for this world, but I feel like he'll go out on his own terms or in a heroic way. Something true to his character. Here he just dies in an alley with a bunch of uh, noblemen or whatever they are with short swords who probably aren't to the level of a Westerosi knight. And instead of, you know, doing something where he saves Daenerys or, or helps Daenerys' army in a way where he, he's the deciding factor in a big battle or whatever and he dies doing it or doing something heroic. Where's Barristan going to save the Mad King, you know, sneaking in and, and saving him? Where's that moment, you know, for his nice send-off? Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I don't want to judge the episode because a character that I really love died, but I guess I kind of have to. So I would give it two and a half fines out of five fines. <laughs> and I think he's going to last longer in the books than you think he will. I think he's a character that makes it to the end, honestly. Yeah. Because he's had so many, you know, he hasn't seen a lot of tragedy, but he's tried to live his life like Brienne. He's always trying to fight for somebody that he believes in, and he finally has that person with Daenerys. And I think he's going to prove himself in the Winds of Winter. Daenerys is going to come home and save the day and be like, thanks for holding the tide, Sir Barry. Here's a candy. You want a butterscotch candy? <laughs> oh, my favorite. It's like, yeah, old people like butterscotches. <laughs> yeah, they do. He's got his whole pockets filled with them. He doesn't eat them. He just collects them. Gives, gives them out. to the children. Yeah. <laughs> Hey guys, thank you for watching this video, and before we go, I want to quickly thank our Patreon supporters. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to grow and evolve as a channel, so thank you for your generous pledges. If you are interested in supporting our channel through Patreon, visit www.patreon.com nerdsoup, and you can see the different rewards we offer to our Patreon supporters. T-shirts, mugs, stickers, access to our behind-the-scenes video, and more. Thanks again for watching this video, and make sure you like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Or dislike, don't share, and unsubscribe. It's a binary world, folks.